Now that we've built a neural network that randomly guesses weights, how do we devise an algorithm that smartly learns better and better weights? Suppose we initialize some random weights, and then we very slightly increase W111. Given that small increase in W111, how will the accuracy of our predictions change? It'd be useful if we could estimate the change in accuracy with respect to a small change in W111. If we knew this and we knew it for every weight, we could implement a procedure where we iteratively increase or decrease the weights a small amount in the direction that improves the overall accuracy. This process is known as gradient ascent, which is just the inverse of gradient descent, a classic and very popular optimization algorithm. Here's a quick primer on gradient descent. Suppose you have a function like 2x squared minus x plus 1, and you want to find where the function achieves its global minimum. The way you learned to do this in calculus was to calculate the derivative of the function, 4x minus 1, set that equal to 0, solve for the critical points, and then test those to see if they're mins, maxes, or saddle points. But suppose instead the function was 1 6 x to the 6 minus 1 half x squared minus x, the derivative of which is x to the 5th minus x minus 1. Set that equal to 0, and you're left with the nasty job of finding the roots of a 5 degree polynomial. Gradient descent helps with functions like this where finding the critical points directly with calculus is hard. It works as follows. Suppose you want to find an x that minimizes some function f of x, which some people write as argmin sub x f of x. Start by picking a random x star. Next, calculate the derivative of f with respect to x, evaluated at x star. Then, step in the direction of the negative derivative. Typically, the step size here is called alpha, so you end up with x star is updated as x star minus alpha times the derivative of f evaluated at x star. And then repeat 2 and 3 a thousand times, or until your steps get really tiny, or some other clever stopping condition. Getting back to our nasty polynomial, Suppose we pick a starting point like x star equals negative 0.57. The slope or derivative at this point is negative 0.49. So, assuming we use a step size of 0.13, our first update to x star would look like this. If we repeat this process, you can see how we eventually converge on the function's minimum. Now, suppose the function you wanted to minimize was negative cosine of x divided by x squared plus 10. The derivative of this guy is sine of x times x squared plus 10 plus 2x cosine x divided by x squared plus 10 squared. If you happen to start here, where x star equals 4, using a step size equal to 6, you'll end up converging on the nearby local minimum instead of the global minimum. We won't go too deep here, but this is a big issue for neural networks, and there's a lot of research devoted to avoiding these local minima. Lastly, suppose we have a multivariable function, like f of x1 x2 equals sine of 5x1 times cosine of 5x2 divided by 5 plus 0.25. In this case, we need to calculate the gradient of f the vector of partial derivatives of f with respect to x1 and f with respect to x2. Then we proceed just like the single variable case, except here we make what's called a gradient step, where we simultaneously move in the best x1 and x2 direction. And as usual, we repeat this process a bunch of times until we converge on a minimum. Let's get back to our neural network model. The thing we're trying to optimize is accuracy rate. To put this in the context of gradient descent, the thing we want to minimize is negative accuracy rate. Unfortunately, accuracy rate isn't a differentiable metric, which means we can't use it with gradient descent. So why isn't accuracy rate differentiable? 
Well, if you think about a vector of predictions and a vector of true labels, so vectors of zeros and ones, you can't answer the question, how will a small change in one of the inputs change the output? Because the inputs aren't even defined on a continuous range. The concept of a small change in one of the inputs isn't even a valid concept. Secondly, each of the hidden layer nodes and the output node suffer from a discontinuity. As we increase one of the input weights, the output abruptly changes from 0 to 1, or from 1 to 0. In other words, our model isn't a smooth function, thus it's not differentiable. And if our goal is to use gradient descent, we'll need our model to be a smooth, differentiable function. So, we need to make some adjustments to our model. First, we'll deal with the discontinuities, where we convert the input to 0 or 1. Graphically, the transformation looks like this. Z here is the sum of the inputs into a single node, and F is the output. The formal name for this guy is the Heaviside Step Function, and clearly it's not differentiable. With this picture in mind, if you had to draw a differentiable function that basically mimics the Heaviside Step Function, the obvious choice would be something like this. The class of functions that take the shape of an S like this are known as sigmoids. Two common sigmoid functions used with neural networks are the logistic function and the hyperbolic tangent. We'll proceed with the logistic function, since that's sort of the classical activation function. By the way, these nodes are commonly called activation nodes, and the functions on top of them are commonly called activation functions. Next we'll address our scoring metric. We can't use accuracy rate, not only because it isn't differentiable, but now that we're applying the logistic function to the output node, our model's gonna output a continuous range of values between zero and one, which aren't valid inputs for calculating accuracy rate. So we need a scoring metric that meets the following criteria. It needs to operate on input vectors y hat and y, where y hat i is an element in the range zero to one, and yi is an element in the set 0, 1. The closer y hat i is to yi, the better the score should be, and it should be differentiable. With this criteria in mind, what scoring metric pops into your head? That's right, log loss. For the uninitiated, given a prediction y hat i in the range 0 to 1, and a true label yi also in the range 0 to 1, the log loss of this individual prediction equals negative yi times log of y hat i minus 1 minus yi times log of 1 minus y hat i. Then the total log loss equals the average log loss across all predictions. I'll use a lowercase l to signify the log loss for a single sample and a capital L to signify the average log loss for all predictions. Let's think about this a bit. First of all, this is a loss function. So as we improve our predictions, the log loss score should decrease. Secondly, y hat i and y i should both be in the range 0 to 1 because they're meant to be interpreted as probabilities. For us, y i is even simpler because it's restricted to the set 0 or 1. Now, suppose yi equals 0. Looking at the definition of log loss and plugging in yi equals 0, we're left with negative log of 1 minus y hat i. Graphically, that looks like this. As y hat i gets closer to the true label, 0, log loss approaches its minimum value, 0. Now suppose yi equals 1. Again, looking at the definition of log loss and plugging in yi equals 1, we're left with negative log of y hat i. Graphically, that looks like this. As y hat i gets closer to the true label 1, log loss approaches its minimum value 0. Also note that log loss is differentiable for y and y hat in the range 0 to 1. So, as long as our predictions never reach or exceed 0 or 1, which must be true because every prediction comes directly out of the logistic function, 
then we know our log loss objective function is differentiable. So log loss conveniently checks the three requirements we had for picking a scoring function. Before we start calculating derivatives, let's update our neural network picture. Now let's revisit our goal. Our goal was to determine how a small increase in W111 would affect our accuracy rate. With our modifications in place, now we want to determine how a small increase in W111 would affect our log loss. That is, we want to know the derivative of the total log loss, capital L, with respect to W111. More generally, if we can determine the gradient of L with respect to all the weights in W1 and all the weights in W2, then we can make a gradient step, updating every weight simultaneously. The first thing to recognize is that since capital L is just the average of the individual log losses, and the individual log losses are independent of each other, the gradient of capital L with respect to W1 is just the average of the gradient of L1 with respect to W1, L2 with respect to W1, and so on. And the gradient of cap L with respect to W2 is just the average of the gradient of L1 with respect to W2, L2 with respect to W2, and so on. So we can shift our focus from capital L to lowercase l. That is, how does the log loss of an individual sample change with respect to small changes in the weights? It may seem a little bit daunting at first, but let's start at the end of our model and work our way backwards. The last thing our model spits out is a prediction. So let's understand how a small change in a prediction affects log loss. That is, we want to find partial li, partial y hat i. Recall the definition of log loss on an individual sample i is this. So, with some high school calculus, we can determine partial li, partial y hat i to be y hat minus y divided by y hat times 1 minus y hat. Let's put that derivative in our pocket, so to speak. It'll be useful later. Next, let's see if we can determine Z2's effect on the ith log loss. That is, we want to calculate partial Li, partial Z2 I1. Well, Li can be written as log loss of y hat i, y i, where y hat i equals logistic of Z2 I1. Notice we have a composition of functions, so we can reach into our calculus tool belt and whip out the chain rule which tells us if you have two differentiable functions f and g, and f is composed with g, like this, then the derivative of f with respect to x is the product of the derivative of f composed with g times the derivative of g. In Leibniz notation, if z depends on y and y depends on x, then dz over dx equals dz over dy, times dy over dx. With the chain rule at our disposal, we find that partial li partial z2 i1 equals partial li partial y hat i times partial y hat i partial z2 i1. Well, we just calculated partial li partial y hat i, so the only thing left for us to do is to calculate partial y hat i partial z2 i1. Recall, y hat i equals 1 divided by 1 plus e to the negative z2 i1. Again, with some high school math, we can figure out that the derivative resolves to this. Going a bit further, it turns out that this equals y hat i times 1 minus y hat i. This definition is super useful. Why? The thing in the back of our heads is computational complexity. If these derivatives are hard to compute, gradient descent could take a really, really long time. Now, y hat is kind of hard to compute, but we have to compute y hat during the forward pass. So as long as we cache those values, meaning we don't delete them, we can reuse them during gradient descent. Next, let's calculate the gradient of li with respect to w2. 
So the gradient is a one column matrix that looks like this. Once again, we can use the chain rule because we can describe li as a function of z2i, where z2i itself is a function of w2. For example, partial li partial w2 1 1 equals partial li partial z2i times partial z2i partial w2 1 1. Generalizing that a bit, we get the gradient of li with respect to w2 equals partial li partial z2i times the gradient of z2i with respect to w2. And since z2 is just the sum product of w2 and x2, the gradient of z2i with respect to w2 is literally just x2i. Putting it all together, we get the gradient of li with respect to w2 equals partial li partial z2i times x2i transpose. Although, I'm going to do something cheeky here and reverse the order of these terms because that makes things a little more elegant down the road. By the way, with nearly the same exact logic, we find that the gradient of li with respect to x2i equals partial li partial z2i times w2 transpose. That'll come in handy, so we'll put that in our pocket for later. The next thing we want to figure out is the gradient of li with respect to z1i. In matrix form, that looks like this. Let's focus on this first guy. Well, li equals some function of x2i1, where x2i1 is a function of z1i1. So, partial li partial z1i1 equals partial li partial x2i1 times partial x2i1 partial z1i1. That equals partial li partial x2i1 times x2i1 times 1 minus x2i1. Keeping in mind, we already know partial li partial x2i1. Generalizing this, we get the gradient of li with respect to z1i equals the gradient of li with respect to x2i tensor product this row of partial derivatives. The tensor product here means we do element-wise multiplication instead of normal matrix multiplication. We can replace these partial derivatives with x2i times 1 minus x2i based on the discovery we made earlier about the derivative of the logistic function. And so, reorganizing things a bit, we get the gradient of li with respect to z1i equals the gradient of li with respect to x2i tensor product x2i tensor product 1 minus x2i. Last but not least, we want to know the gradient of li with respect to w1, which ultimately is going to be a big matrix like this. Going through the same sort of steps as before, we find that it's equal to x1i transpose times the gradient of li with respect to z1i. Recapping, here are the important derivatives we calculated. And you can kind of see with these arrows the order in which you'd calculate each of these terms. One thing I'll note is that there's a really nice simplification when you do this multiplication. So in practice, you'd probably skip the calculation of partial li partial y hat i and go straight to calculating partial li partial z2i1. Also keep in mind that we want to calculate all of these terms for every single training sample. So by the end, we'll have these two arrays, gradient of L with respect to W1 and gradient of L with respect to W2, each of which is a three-dimensional array like these. And then we can average these terms across the sample dimension, reducing them to two-dimensional arrays like these, which represent the gradient of capital L with respect to W1 and the gradient of capital L with respect to W2. And then finally, we can make our gradient step where we update W1 and W2 like this. In order to implement gradient descent, we'll start by building some helper functions 
the first of which is the standard logistic function. The logistic function is defined as 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x. Unfortunately, when x is a big negative number, like minus 1000, Python throws an overflow error because e to the negative x is really big. The fix for this is pretty easy. There's an identity for the logistic function that says 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x equals e to the x divided by e to the x plus 1. So when x is positive, we use the function 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x, and when x is negative, we use the function e to the x divided by e to the x plus 1. Now we can input values like minus 1000 without getting an overflow error. Unfortunately, we still have an issue. If we do logistic of np.array 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, you can see that once x reaches 32, the logistic function just starts outputting 1. That means for inputs to the logistic function outside the range negative 32 to 32, there's no discernible difference in the output. This is going to end up affecting our gradient descent algorithm such that some gradients are going to end up being zero instead of a really small number, and then our model won't know which direction to step to make an improvement. The solution to this is to normalize the input data. There are different ways to do this, but for grayscale values, an easy normalization scheme is just to divide every value by 255 so that inputs fall into the range 0 to 1. Technically, this isn't guaranteed to solve our problem, but it makes it harder for us to stumble upon a 0 gradient. Next, we'll implement a log loss function that inputs two one-dimensional NumPy arrays, y hat and y, and outputs a third one-dimensional NumPy array with the sample or case log loss values. With these helper functions in place, see if you can code up a neural network that learns to identify checkerboards in the simple images dataset. A little word of advice. You'll probably want to implement what's called a gradient checker. The concept goes like this. Suppose you're searching for the minimum of z equals x1 squared plus x1 times x2 with gradient descent. You correctly calculate that the gradient of z with respect to x equals the vector 2x1 plus x2, x1. But you've made an error coding this up. So suppose your starting point, x star, is x1 equals 1, x2 equals 2, which implies z equals 3. And your program incorrectly says that the gradient at this point is 1, 0. The way you can catch this mistake is with a gradient checker. The way this works is you make a small change in one of the elements of x star. For example, you might create a new point like 1.1, 2. Then you calculate z at this new point, which equals 3.41. Now you can estimate partial z partial x1 as the change in z divided by the change in x1, which equals 4.1. Since this value is pretty far off from our analytically determined gradient of 1, we know we made some sort of mistake. Now, gradient checking is slow and expensive, so it's something you only want to do once when you're developing your model, just to make sure you built it correctly. So with that said, pause the video and see if you can implement your first neural network with gradient descent. Here's the code I came up with. Let's break it down. The init method is exactly the same as it was in the last section. The fit method is where most of the changes are. Starting with the function parameters, we gained a step size parameter, which lets us control our gradient descent step size, and iters, which lets us control how many gradient descent steps to make. 
In this initialization block, note that we divide x by 255 in order to normalize the grayscale values to be between 0 and 1. Then we enter the gradient descent loop, where we do a forward pass, report the logged loss, then we do a backward pass where we calculate grad w1 and grad w2, and then we use those gradients to update w1 and w2. The tricky part here is translating the theory we developed into NumPy array operations. The best advice I can give you is just to step through the code with some toy data and to also spend some time studying NumPy array math so that it doesn't feel like a black box. You can always check out my course, Python NumPy for your grandma, to brush up on your NumPy. Lastly, the predict method is nearly the same as it was before, except I incorporated the logistic function and I added the ability to return the predicted class labels or the predicted class probabilities. Let's see how it performs on the simple images data. As usual, we'll start by loading the simple images data into train and test data frames. Then we'll initialize and fit a neural network with four hidden nodes to identify checkerboards with step size 0.3, 10,000 iterations, and random seed 0. And lastly, we'll use the fitted network to make predictions on the test data. In this case, we get a test accuracy rate of about 0.74. Let's try that again, except this time let's set the random seed equal to 1. This time, we get a test accuracy rate of about 0.98. This highlights how if you're unlucky in your randomly initialized weight matrices, gradient descent can get stuck in a local minimum. But when you get the initialization right, you can see how powerful neural networks can be. Next, let's focus on generalizing our model. Some nice improvements would be support for multi-class predictions, support for multiple hidden layers, and support for stochastic gradient descent. I'll explain what that is and why it'd be nice to have later, but in the next section, we're going to focus on support for multi-class predictions.